welcome to our midweek worship service at First United Methodist Church in Warren. The scripture for today comes from the Gospel of John. We're in the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Next to Easter, Epiphany is the oldest season of the church year. In Asia Minor in Egypt, Epiphany was observed as early as the second century. The festival of the Epiphany fell and still falls on January 6th. It was observed as what is known as a unitive festival. Both the birth and baptism of Jesus were celebrated at this time. January 6th was chosen as Epiphany Day because it was the winter solstice, a pagan festival celebrating the birthday of the sun god. In 331 AD, the solstice was moved to December 25th, but January 6th continued to be observed. Christians substituted Epiphany for the solstice. The emphasis was upon the rebirth of light. In keeping with this time, the first lesson of Epiphany Day is appropriate. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The unitive festival of Epiphany was divided when December 25th was chosen by the church as the birthday of Jesus. The church in the East continued to celebrate Epiphany in terms of baptism of Jesus, while the Western church associated Epiphany with the visit of the Magi. For the East, the baptism of Jesus was more vital because of the Gnostic heresies claiming that only at his baptism did Jesus become the Son of God. For centuries, we've associated Epiphany with the Magi. And that certainly is appropriate, for the Magi did not get to Bethlehem until at least a year after Jesus' birth. By this time, the Holy Family was in a house rather than a stable. Consequently, the Magi could not have been a part of the manger scene as we popularly portray them in Christmas scenes and plays. In the church year, Epiphany Day is a major festival, similar to Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. In spite of this, more churches ignore January 6th as the day of Epiphany because it usually falls on a weekday. In fact, this year is a perfect example. January 6th is the middle of the week. So some churches celebrated last week and some will celebrate next Sunday. The name Epiphany means manifestation. The light manifests itself in the darkness. God reveals himself in Jesus. And the glory of God is seen in Christ. In the course of history, Epiphany was known by other names. Feast of the Manifestation, Feast of Lights, Feast of the Appearing of Christ, Feast of the Three Kings, and the Twelfth Night. The color used in pyramids denotes the mood and meaning of the season. White is used because it expresses light, glory, victory, celebration. And then green is used on the Sundays other than the above. Green is the color of growth, and during Epiphany, we are to grow, grow into a fuller realization of the nature of Christ as the Son of God. Sunday after Sunday, there is growth in God's revealing his glory in Jesus. For four weeks uh, in November and December, we lit the Advent candle in church, preparing 
for the birth of Jesus. From this point on until Good Friday, we change and light a single candle, the Christ candle. It is also a part of the Epiphany tradition. A candle sheds light into d dark world. Christ is the light of the world. He comes into the world as a baby, a small, frail candle. It is the nature of light to scatter and to annihilate darkness. Light brings vision and insight. Because of light, there is revelation. During Epiphany, we see the light of God in Jesus. He reveals, he shows, he manifests God. Light has certain characteristics. It is a given light. The light that comes from God comes from the star. We are not the light. At best, we can reflect the light. Another characteristic of light is that it gives itself. The candle gives light only by virtue of burning itself up. Light, to be light, must give, must expend, must die to self. At the end of Epiphany, we see the light of Christ at its brightest, but it burns itself out at the cross, only to be rekindled again on Easter. Of course, this is also the beginning of a new year. Did you realize that the New Year's Day is the one holiday that is the most universally celebrated? It is the world's most observed holiday. It is both an end and a beginning, and as such offers, in a sense, the chance to, shall we say, begin again. For many, it is a time for making resolutions. The late Irma Bombeck made memorable resolutions over the years. Uh, she used to list them this time. One, I will go to no doctor whose office plants have died. Two, I, I'm going to follow my husband's suggestion to put a little excitement into my life by living within a budget. Three, I'm going to apply for a hardship scholarship to Weight Watchers. And four, I will never loan my car to anyone I have not given birth to. Writer Ed McManus has some words of comfort for those who are setting resolutions. He says, don't worry about keeping those New Year's resolutions. You only have to deal with them basically until March, and then you can, can give them up for Lent. Resolutions are good, especially if there are changes that we need to make in our lives. I read about one poor guy who dialed his girlfriend and got the following recording. I'm not available right now, but thank you for caring enough to call. I'm making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, you are one of the changes. The beginning of the Gospel of John is also a traditional reading for the beginning of a new year. In it, John puts the emphasis not on the past, but on the future. Not on regrets, but on possibilities. John is focused not on what we have been or even what we are now. Rather, it focuses on what we can yet be. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Isn't that what you really want as you begin a new year? To know deep down in your heart that you can be more than you are today and that you have a right to become a child of God? Isn't it that what we really want to know, that we can live the next 365 days confidently aware that our life matters? to know that God is with us and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Tony Buzzin in his book, The Power of Verbal Intelligence, gives a wonderful example of the potential each of us brought into the world. He tells the story of the origins of the Suzuki method that has helped millions of children learn to play the violin. It begins with a Japanese teacher, musician, instrument maker named, of course, Suzuki. Suzuki had two moments in his life when he gained life-changing insight. Suzuki's first revelation came when he was visiting a building that served as a giant incubator for thousands of Japanese songbirds known as larks. The breeders of the larks uh, 
uh, take literally thousands of eggs. They incubate them in giant, warm, silent halls that act like a gigantic nest. There's only one sound that the tiny songbirds hear as they break their shells. It is the sound of another lark, a very special adult lark that is chosen because of its singing ability. Suzuki noticed to his amazement that every little chick that hatched automatically began to copy the master singer lark. Even more remarkable, after a few days, he observed that each chick, having started out purely copying a song, began to develop its own variation on the original master song. The breeders wait until the chick musicians have developed their own styles and then select from them the next master singer. And so the process continues on and on again. Astounding, thought Suzuki. If a bird's tiny, tiny brain can learn so perfectly, then surely the human brain, with its vastly superior abilities, should be able to do the same and even better. This line of reasoning led Suzuki to his next revelation. The revelation that every Japanese child learns to speak Japanese. When Suzuki pointed that out to his friends, they simply laughed at him and assured him that they already knew that. But, but no, no, he declared, they, they really do. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And Suzuki was correct. Like Newton before him, he discovered something so obvious that no one could see it. No one could see that any baby born in any country automatically learns within two years the language of that country. This means that every normal baby's brain is capable of learning millions of potential languages. Now think about uh, a few moments and, and you'll realize what an amazing thing that is. Given the proper environment, human beings are capable of acquiring an amazing amount of information and skill in a rather short time. There's something more our text is saying to us, however. We also have an enormous untapped spiritual potential. Now, this is a concept that, that many of us don't grasp, but it is vitally important. Notice the text doesn't say that Christ came into the world so that we can improve our IQs or that we will be able to run the mile in a record time. It says whoever receives Christ and believes on his name has the potential to become a child of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that you and I have the potential to be like Christ. We have a potential within our hearts and souls for peace, a potential for joy, a potential for hope, a potential for love, a potential for forgiveness that is greater than we can possibly imagine. Try to grasp the significance of that truth. We no longer have to live lives filled with inner conflict, with anger, resentment, fear, hatred, rejection, guilt. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, we can become new people. We can become God's people. And that is why we make resolutions this time of year. Because we intend to be, to become something new, something better. But from a spiritual perspective, it is something so very much more that we celebrate. You and I can be more than we are. And it doesn't depend on our background. It doesn't depend on our physical or our mental limitations. It doesn't depend on our age. Many older people may find themselves slowing down physically, sometimes even mentally, but, but there need be no slowdown in our ability to be children of God. This is a gift that never fades or never fails. It is a gift. The right to be children of God is not something we earn. It is a gift from a loving, merciful God. Note again John's words, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's not a matter of how often we come to God's house. It's not how often we read our Bibles. It's not how often we pray. We don't earn the right to be children of God. It is a gift. The writer of the Gospel of John told us that 2,000 years ago, to all who received him, who believed in his name, 
Christ gave the right to become children of God. After Nathaniel Hawthorne's death, it was discovered he had left some notebooks that contained random ideas that he had jotted down as they occurred to him. One of the short entries read as follows. Suggestion for a story in which the principal character simply never appears. Rabbi Sidney Greenberg once had this to say about Hawthorne's story. Unhappily, this is the story of too many lives. The principal character simply never appears. The person we might grow into, the human being we might become, doesn't show up. Our potential greatness lies unrealized. The splendor remains imprisoned and the promise unfulfilled. Let us pray that doesn't happen to you or to me. God has placed within each of us enormous potential, mental potential, physical potential, but the greatest of all is the spiritual potential, the potential to become children of God. I came across a, a little devotional thought this week I, I, I would like to conclude with. A little baby named Charles Philip Arthur George was born on November 14, 1948 in London, England. This little seven pound, six ounce boy was born to a couple named Philip and Elizabeth. When Charles was just three years old, his grandfather, King George VI, died. His mother then became Queen Elizabeth II. What that meant for Charles was that he would never live as a regular child. Charles instantly became Prince of Wales, heir to the throne. Not because of anything he did, but because of who his mother was. When Queen Elizabeth dies, Charles will become King Charles. From his birth, Charles possessed the title heir to the throne. And from his earliest days, it was drilled into him who he was by birth and what he was destined to become. Every day, he awakens to a reality that he is heir to the throne. Well, let's begin this new year also with a realization that we are heirs, heirs to the throne, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. We have enormous potential physically and mentally. We have even greater potential spiritually. We have the right to become children of God. That's something powerful to live up to in a new year. The right to live like Christ. The right to, to have God as our Father. Let us follow that light into a new year, knowing who we are and to whom we belong. Amen.